uh, as much as really you blew my mind with the uh brianna taylor shooting itself it was the aftermath that 100%. is a, such a bigger story than anyone knows that her mom was in a motorcycle gang that put out a hit for for, paid for, for it and paid for paid it. for with, it with lawsuit money the government gave her oh yeah that's a gofundme account too right oh, there just God, it, it just you know how political the fbi was it just it just goes on and on what what they did to people what they did to your you know to, to your major it just the the brianna shooting store itself is, is half the story no comment <laughs> oh he didn't kill them probably blame me for being an idiot but and which you were which we all were <laughs> you have to make it to where crime doesn't pay you have to deter crime whether it's crime or terrorism it's the same principle you have to clash with supervision you have to or nothing will get done supervisors can't learn how to supervise and you can't learn how to respect a supervisor without confrontation it has to happen <laughs> do not take that out jv team for life ready everything's recording so cigar check drink check i'm not gonna ask if you're ready because every time i do you go yep and then i go to start and you go so wait hold on <laughs> no i'm ready all, all right, right. I'm, I'm easy day yusuf you good i'm good all right welcome back to the anti-hero podcast part delta force part street cop all podcast i'm tyler owner of refracted wolf apparel use promo code anti-hero to get 15 percent off the best outsider culture graphic tees hats stickers flags and ranger panties and I'm Brent Tucker, owner of First Responder Cigar and Coffee Company. Use FRC15 to get 15% off the world's best coffee and cigars. Is that a new hat? This is a new hat. Yeah, we just launched it for uh, July 4th. Nice. Well, well, everybody, look at you. So you, you every, know nothing gets by you. Yeah. If you didn't get it, too bad. I, well, your, your July 4th sale's over, right? That's right. Yeah. It was it was on sale for seventeen seventy six. We're creative like that. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I lost money on my sale. Uh, 30% <laughs> off, dude. You had to compete with everybody. I was like, I don't know how these guys do 30% off their stores all no, weekend. No, we definitely lost some money. <laughs> and of course, this episode is brought to you by Ghostbed. Sleep so good, it's scary. Ghostbed provides high quality and super comfortable award-winning mattresses crafted in the United States and Canada. Did you know that 60% of all U.S. adults report being too hot when they're trying to sleep? I didn't know that. I thought it was just me. Uh, you got to say, say fun fact before that, though. Oh, damn it. Yeah, well, I thought it was because I was in Florida, and it's oh, God, Florida. No matter what time of the year, because you're menopause. Here. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they have patented cooling technology exclusive to ghost beds. So if you're too hot when you sleep, ghost bed is the only one that has it. Go to ghost bed. If you go to ghost bed, use forward slash antihero, ghostbed.com forward slash antihero, or you go to ghostbed.com and use promo code antihero, you'll save fifty percent off your mattress or your cooling sheets or your ghost bed pillow. Uh, so support them because they support us and save 50% using uh, promo code anti-hero. And we're not going to do current events uh, this episode. Uh, we'd have done we're, we're, our squad cast uh, would, would have already happened uh, Thursday. We're going to do them every Thursday. I feel like we're in a movie timeline. It hasn't happened. It hasn't happened by yet. the time you see That's this, right. it has happened. That's right. At 8 p.m. Eastern. So uh, tune in every Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern for current events and for a good time with that. Really looking forward to that. So it's a few days away for us. And we are still in the works of planning Shell Shock. So that's going to be October 19th in Orlando, Florida. It's going to be a big meetup event. Oh, you want to come? Yeah, I might. You want to go to, <laughs> we'll go to Rock Show? Oh, you want to commit now? <laughs> <laughs> but a lot, a lot of people are going to be coming in for it. It's, it's going to be, I guess we're going to do a meetup weekend. So failure to stop. All those guys are going to come Friday night and do a live comedy show and a live broadcast. And we're actually going to do a live all day. I didn't tell you this. I talked to Yusuf. Uh, a live show all day that Saturday. A live Love stream it. in case people can't make it. They'll be able to watch the bands. Uh, so yeah, uh, we we're talk we're we're lock trying to lock in headliners right now. So as soon as we have those headliners. Uh, the flyer will be put out and then people can start making. We just want to put it on y'all's radar. October 19th. Come hang out with us in Orlando. I'm looking forward to that. And I've been looking forward to this. This is something that's been in the works for probably months now. Yeah. John, we, we, it's been a while. Yeah, we've been talking about this. Uh, and we finally we finally got him in here in studio. Um, next to me is John Mattingly, best-selling author, public speaker, 
Uh, he wrote the book 12 Seconds in the Dark. Um, it's the account of the Breonna Taylor shooting. He knows a little bit about it, not just because he wrote the book, but because he lived it. Yeah. Uh, he was one of the three primary officers involved in the shooting, uh, even even got shot that night. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll let you dive right into it and take it from there. So how did... How did it all come about? Like, how was did it? Was it a normal? Did it even start out weird? Is this? It was just a normal everyday. This is the case we got, and well, everything's so. So everybody thinks that like we were part of the investigation or part of the the thing. We weren't. Um, this this was a case by a brand new squad that was put together, and um, this was their very first investigation. They had just created this new thing called place based investigation, which was a, a model from Cincinnati. Uh, into Louisville that basically was a, a primary target oriented crew that said, if, if Tyler's causing issues, we're going to focus only on him, put our blinders on, not do anything, but uh, get Tyler until he's in prison. Right. So uh, eliminate all the other aspects of the job that you normally do, where if you see something happening while you're working, you know, we kind of, we're all over the place. Yeah. In like squirrels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We can't, <laughs> we can't stay focused. <laughs> So this was a focus-based crew that said, hey, go in and precisely take out these guys that are causing issues. So Jamarcus Glover, for reasons that we didn't know at the time or they didn't know at the time, was the first target. Later on, it was revealed that uh, this was a whole gentrification thing by the mayor's office, that they needed these two houses on a block that they've been trying to acquire for about a year and a half, uh, that the owner said, I'm not selling, I'm not selling. And this guy was selling drugs out of them. Wait, so, so this all started at the at – the- the mayor's. request of the mayor. Yes. I wonder if the mayor took any responsibility. Oh, in no, that's the reason the lawsuit was settled. We'll get into that. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but once that was brought up, that's when the lawsuit got settled. 12 million bucks. Boom. Before any criminal activity or uh, actions were taking place in court. Um, but to go back to, to the thing that the lead detective on this case, and again, this was kind of a new, it was a brand new unit, uh, guys and, and a female with very limited experience with long case investigations and, and they put them on this, t- on this case. Well, I had just moved from major case narcotics where I'd been a few years. I had TFOs and FBI and DEA. I was, um, I had my clearance with the FBI and I just moved over to our parcel team, which is investigated, uh, parcels coming in from UPS and FedEx. And we had broken ties with the postal service about two years prior to me going here because of a, a big, big, everybody had their, their feelings mm-hmm. hurt over an informant that was used. That was a, uh, a worker for the federal government. And evidently that's against their rules. So there was a big pissing contest there. They took their ball and went home. We no longer worked with postal. Whose rules? The post office? Yeah. Well, the, yeah, the federal government's rules. Okay. You the can't federal, use okay. one of their employees as an informant. Okay. And um, I don't know if our guys didn't know or if they didn't care. It's, we're asking for forgiveness didn't work. No, no, <laughs> no. The feds came in and they wanted every single one of the informant files that we had. And they wanted to go through them comb, with a fine tooth comb to decide if any other employees in our department said, no, it's against state law. We can't just hand you over, you know, paperwork. So it went to court. It was a big battle. Um, so anyway, when this guy came to me, the, the lead detective, James, he came to me and he said, hey, Sarge, do you have, can you look up this address for me? And he gave me 3003 Springfield Drive and and said, Jamarcus Glover, does he have any packages going there? And I said, well, who's it through? He said, Postal. I said, dude, I have no connection with Postal. I don't even know who they are. Um, and I didn't know who the inspector was, knew nothing. I said, but I know who works with them. It's a smaller department on the outskirts of our city. Um, and I know their sergeant. I know their detective that does this. So I texted him while he's standing right there. I said, hey, man, do you have anything on this address? He texted right back and said, I think we might have something on, on, this, on Glover. We're working a J Glover, but I can't be positive. I'll get back with you. Okay. So I simply said, all right, Josh, man, I don't know. Here's his contact information. I shared contact information. Thought I was done with it. About two weeks later, I'm out at UPS working, and I see the, the detective that was going to look up that information for him. And we're pulling packages, and he's working security out there. And I said, hey, man, did you ever get back with Josh on that address I gave you? He said, well, I talked to Kelly, and, and Kelly Goodlett was the, the co-lead on this case, the female. And he said, we started comparing vehicles on the Glover, and we realized it was a different J Glover. They had Jamarcus, <laughs> and they had like a Jerome or something. Okay. Just a coincidence. Yeah. And he said, so no, we, don't, we didn't have anything. So the next morning, I'm, I'm in the office. Josh is walking by, and I stop him and go, hey, man, did you hear Glover has nothing at this apartment? 
And he said, yeah, man, I heard now we got to do all these warrants. I was hoping to just do a rip or reversal. And I said, sorry, dude, not my problem. But, and could you explain what the a rip the, or reversal? Y- yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, a rip or reversal basically is you have knowledge that a package is coming in two, two different ways. You have knowledge that a, a dirty package is coming in. You right. set up on them. When they take it, you do a rip, you collapse on them, you know, whatever, if, whether it's a car, house, foot, whatever, you take them. Uh, a reversal is when you can, you can actually load the package, you intercept it and you load it with a wire. So when it's popped, you're alerted and then you can make you, you already have a warrant written and then you can go ahead and take it, it down. It explodes nice. with that confetti. <laughs> and it says, gotcha. Surprise, you're it. <laughs> gotcha, Congratulations. Um, so I, I was like, dude, I'm sorry. You know, good luck. Yeah. Not my case. I'm busy. I'm, you know, on package warrants. Now, when I was on the street, we were doing three, four, five physical warrants a week, going through doors, hitting, hitting, hitting this for years. And I thought in my mind, I thought, well, I'm going to slow down. I'm coming toward the end of my career. Uh, my time's probably up. I've been so, you know, a thousand doors at this right. point. Something's going to go sideways. I've already been yeah. shot at. I've, we've already had to shoot people, all this stuff. So now I'm at the point where I'm thinking, man, I'm going to kind of taper down a little bit. So I thought, and uh, so we're writing, you know, 40 package warrants a week where you're looking at addresses, names, uh, locations. I'm, there's no way I'm going to remember this 3003 Springfield because March comes around now. And so two months later, their sergeant puts out an email says, Hey, we need anybody we can get for this. This is a, a five warrant operation. They're going simultaneous. It's manpower intensive. And so I looked at the locations. I saw the four that were in the ghetto that I had worked my whole career that the trap houses, they're nasty. You go in, you know, it's just, they, they don't take care of anything. Uh, plus when you hit those doors, man, you're going to get 40, 50, hundred people come out cussing you, saying mm-hmm. stuff. And I'm like, man, I've done this for so many years. I'm just tired of it. And I saw this one that was about 10 miles away in an apartment. And I went, ah, give me that one. I'll take the easy. <laughs> one. I love the easy it. never works out. And so <laughs> I said, give me that one. So I got an email back and they kind of threw a hodgepodge of guys together uh, that had volunteered for this. Not the normal guys we serve, serve warrants with. I'd served with them at different times. You know, they've been plugged in yeah. on different things because it's it's a constant flow. Do they at fluid. least have some kind of tactical experience? Oh, yeah. Okay. All, yeah. Yeah, they did. They weren't all giving you me, like... All except maybe one okay. uh, who's kind of our eye. And he had done warrants, but he didn't he didn't have the level that, that the rest of us have been, you know, yeah. doing warrants over the years. So they said, okay, we'll meet up uh, March 12th, which was a Thursday, 10 p.m. for the brief. And I looked at my schedule, man, I'm working FedEx up till 10. So I thought, this is perfect, man. Easy overtime. Go in, hit this door. It's supposed to be a female there alone, no dogs, no guns, no boyfriends, just her. Cool. Piece of cake, right? So show up at the brief. And this is when things, I should have, my, my brain should have went, all right, go ahead and bail now. So we show up and it starts raining. No big deal. It rains, you know, all the time. Big deal. I come out to my car after the brief with with my gear, and I've got two flat tires on the driver's side. I look at the car behind me; it's got two God's flat like, tires. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, "Well, man, this sucks." So and here I'm getting wet. So then you start getting a little right. aggravated, right? And so I go inside, and I can't find keys to the car because the administrative sergeant works seven a.m. to three p.m. when narcotics activities usually happen at night. Keys are locked away because he's a control freak. And and so I'm breaking into this box trying to find some keys to any car. Just get me on scene because now we got it. Now we're on time crunch because SWAT's already in motion, you know, waiting to move on the target once he gets to the location. Cause and they did a good job. The 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 investigative team, man, they had pole cams, trackers, um, did you have on phones. SWAT going to your location? No, they were going to the other. Because yours, we yours was easy. a soft one. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Easy. And so um I get this car. I'm loading up all my gear. It is dumping rain on me now, right? So what's the thing I forget? My tourniquet. Hadn't used it in 20 years. Yeah. And what usually happened was when I would take my my tack vest off, I would throw it in my glove box because your tack vest goes in your trunk or back seat or wherever you throw it. And I always wanted access to that tourniquet. I totally forgot it during the chaos of all the, all the move. So I go out to the scene and um, I pull up and EMS is sitting right there. At our location, which is only a quarter mile. From- yeah, it's very. Anybody that doesn't know, when you do something like this, the fire rescue stages down the road, um, away from the target, but they have to be there, and you have to coordinate with them. Yeah, and and, and again, and and you said the it's one female is is who you believe is there. Correct. So is the warrant for Brianna Taylor? Her name's on it. Her name, address, social, vehicle. Is that uh, it's not for her? It's, it's a for property. searching the yeah. house. Okay. okay. But okay. she's the she's the leasee of that apartment, so her name's got to be on the warrant. All right. And what was that? The what was what was affiliated Supposed with the house that, that that drove you there? Well, 
going back to the parcel thing where, where we didn't see or where they didn't find anything in Jamarcus Glover's name, which if this detective had asked me, I would have simply said, nobody in their right mind that's good at this dope game sends anything in their name. You know, they'll send yeah. it in John Doe's name yeah. to a girlfriend's apartment, grandma's house. A okay. vacant house. A lot of vacant houses get parcels sent to them. That way, if the police show up and, and Brianna's holding this package, yeah. she can go, so, so this is I know where this right. package yeah. came from. Wrong address. Yeah. I was just stealing it. I don't know. What it <laughs> so, so, but they never ask. You okay. know, they're young again, not yeah. real uh, mature in this stuff. And so, when I get there, I look at EMS and it's two young guys. There's a black guy driving, a white guy in the passenger seat, probably like my kid's age, like young 20s. Yeah. And uh, the driver's got these headphones on. The passenger's got his phone playing with it. <laughs> and I look over and I uh, honk my horn. They don't hear me. I get my flashlight out, finally get their attention. And and the driver, man, he rolls the window down. He can't get the things out of his dreads. They're stuck. And I'm thinking, oh, crap, this ain't good, you know. And I say, you're here for us? Yeah, okay, well, hopefully we'll be quick and get out of here. I remember getting out, walking up when I'm putting my uh, some of my stuff on. And I look at Nobles, Mike Nobles, who would end up, who's the breacher. And I said, man, I hope these guys ain't got to save our lives because they're inexperienced, <laughs> man. You can just tell. <laughs> what time of day is this, by the way? This is coming up on midnight at okay. this point. All right, all right. Uh, so we're getting ready to roll into, again, March, Friday the 13th, full moon. And I'm thinking. <laughs> flat tires. <laughs> yeah, flat tires. John, is, is, is anybody man. doing surveillance on the house before yeah, you guys Yeah, so there's hit? somebody sitting on the house. Okay. Still, has an eye on the house. Um, and we didn't get any information of anybody coming or going. Um don't know exactly the specifics when he got there because he was there when we came to the brief at 10. So maybe they were already inside at this point. Who knows? Gotcha. Um, so we get there and I say, man, I've never seen this place. I'm going to at least roll by and check it out, see what's up. Because we have no VO, which is a verification officer that says this is the door when you walk up. Normally, you got somebody that will flashlight it or, or pin light it and say yeah. this is it. And so since none of us were involved in the case, I rolled by and I talked to the guy on the eye. And I was like, man, when I get there. I'm going to hit my brake lights. Tell me if that's it. There's a plumbing van out front. He said, so I pull up next to it and he said, that's it. So this building, just to give you a, a background, uh, there's, I think four buildings in this complex. They're all eight plexes. So there's four on the bottom, four on the top. Well, they're actually 16. They're connected. Uh, but this one was four on the bottom, four on the top. Uh, Brianna's apartment was the bottom right hand one. There's some metal staircase that goes up right. Her door's right underneath it. Um, so I get there. He says, that's it. So I turn around and go back. We all gear up. That's when I realized I don't have my tourniquet. And I said something to Mike again about that. I'm like, crap, I don't need my tourniquet tonight. <laughs> just all these things just click, click. Looking back, you go, man, the red flags were there. I just, yeah, I didn't right. see them. And uh, so we gear up and SWAT says, okay, we're, we're approaching. And so we go and, and we come around. And as I'm pulling in, I see this Toyota Sequoia sitting there that wasn't there 10 minutes ago, right in front of our doorway. So the cars are parked uh, perpendicular to the building. This car is parallel. And I'm thinking, where did this car come from? And why didn't the eye tell me? Now, the eye is a buddy of mine, man. He was in my wedding. We're good friends. I don't yeah. hold it against him. He may have been on the phone. Who knows what happened? Yeah. Um, but he missed it. So now I went from, which isn't right, but my guard was honestly here to here. You know, it instantly goes up. The radar does going, man, I don't know who this guy or girl right. is, what apartment they went right. into, what they Sounds take. Out of place. Yeah, this ain't right. So I get on the radio and go, where'd this car come from? Who was in it? Well, I didn't get an answer. So now I'm kind of mad, right? So they they unload where they're supposed to, a building down. They're coming up the sidewalk. I went ahead and pulled up behind this to make sure nobody's in it. Yeah. So I clear the vehicle. I remember a baby seat in the back, some trash. I go around the front of it, and I meet them as they're coming up into the doorway. And it ended up being a blessing because as I started banging on the door, well, the first we knocked because they wanted us. They told us in the brief originally was a no knock because everybody go no knock no knock no knock ban no knocks this was not a no knock warrant yeah okay there's no reason to no right. knock right it's supposed to be right. a soft yeah. target had jamarcus glover went to that location it was signed for a no knock had he been there because that's basically who the no knock was on with his violent past and all the stuff which is something else the media took and ran with oh, a lot of not not just yeah, the media even accurate. the politicians that some of them i even like the Rand Pauls of the world yeah. You know, use it to his benefit to pass a law that he's been wanting to pass for years. Yeah. So you're saying it was a no-knock warrant. It was it was signed you, as a no-knock. Just in but case. We had, the, we had the discretion, or they had the discretion to call it off, and they did. And fortunately, yeah. when we were in the brief, I took a picture of the board that said, knock and announce, above okay. this address. Yeah. Um, so we were able to send that out to kind of quell that, but it was too late because yeah. the, oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the media scurry was on. So because Jamarcus Glover was heading to Elliott Avenue, they said, 
not going to announce. They said, matter of fact, if you will give it extra time because she's a heavy set black female, not because she's black, but they were given the description of her. Yeah. She's heavy set. Give her more time to come to the door because we want her to cooperate. Brent fat. Cool, no problem. People, so. And um, <laughs> a bitch, yeah, you know, yeah, hypothetically or whatever you want to call it, allegedly. Thick. And so we get up there and I knock normal, just like you're on a, you know, delivering pizza, just hoping she'll come to the door. Neighbors won't come out. You just don't want the drama. You know, you're over it at this point in your career. You're like, let me right. just get my money and get out. And not stealing because that's what they said we were there to do. Steal money. The attorney was bizarre. Are you oh, dude, that was all over the newspaper. Oh. We were there to rob them. And we were, God. there was a gas can inside in one of the pictures. They said, we brought it. We're going to burn the place down after. I mean, just bizarre. <laughs> and people bid on it. People believe everything these idiots said. So, uh, we get there and I knock, no answer. And then when I pulled up, I could see her bedroom light. Her car was out front. I could see her bedroom light, the not the light, the TV was on in, and I could see the blue <clears throat> flashing through the window. So I knock on the door, no answer. Knock again, no answer. So third time, it's time to go, right? Boom, 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 boom. Police search warrant. Police search warrant, come to the door. The loud police knock that everybody knows. And on that first knock, it was loud enough that the guy that drove the Sequoia happened to be in the apartment right above hers, pops out. What are y'all doing? He starts arguing. Brett Hankinson, the one who's later charged in, in this event, um, addressed him. Get back in the apartment. Get back in the apartment. Because we don't know who's threats and who's not on scene. Yeah. When people pop out and start it was a yelling. a different apartment, though. Yes. Okay. Um, but the blessing in that turned out to be he's African descent. He's not from America. He's here. He's a truck driver. He happened to be picking his child up. The girl was babysitting him because he's an over-the-road truck driver. He was picking his child up. So he's the only one that in the interviews actually told the truth that, yeah, I heard him knock and announce. Yep. Yeah. So Which is the whole witness. point yeah. of knock and yes. announce. So everybody around yes. that target can hear and they go, yeah, they, they yeah, were loud bringing the neighbor out upstairs, yeah. it's loud enough. Um, so this goes on. He goes back in. Um, we bang for about four more cadences. So we're about six or seven total of boom, boom, boom. Police search warrant come to the door yelling. And I'm the, I'm the, obviously the one, you know, you've got your, I'm the one announcing, I'm the one doing all the talking at this point. And on the last time I look back at my Lieutenant, cause nobody's come to this door because right before the last knock, the breacher noble said, wait a minute, I think I heard somebody inside. So we paused. And before I knocked again, I yelled, if you're there, come out, we got a search warrant. This is the police. Nothing. We're listening hear nothing. So one more time, boom, 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 police search warrant. I look back, my Lieutenant, he gives the nod. I say, here we go. So Mike hits the door. Well, the first time's right on the dead boat. That door ain't going nowhere. Yeah. You know, uh, just bent the dead boat a little bit. One of the guys made a comment. Oh, my daughter hits harder than that or something <laughs> like that, to that effect. Right. Second time, boom, hits it solid. It almost comes open. I could see, I remember seeing the dead boat actually bent and I could see through the door. I could see into the living room because I'm on the left of the door. He's on the right. The door goes from right to left. Okay. So I'm on the left side of the door. I said, here we go. And he hits it. It comes flying open. At this point, we do what everybody does. Everybody's going, please search warrant, please search warrant, please search warrant. So I'm able to slice the pie from right to left until I have no more real estate. I've got the door jam on this side of me, the wall going down the hall here. I remember the couch, the curtains, the painting on the wall. I remember all that. You could see it and I stopped. So at this point, I move, take one simple left to right step. And as my gun's coming around with the light, I remember seeing down the hallway, my brain went, I mean, and things are, it's, a, I, you know, I've realized this, but you don't realize it until you're in one of these incidents that, that is repeated over and over and over. Cause usually you have these incidents that happen where nobody's life's taken and then you're off to the next one. And then you're yeah. off to the next. You don't have time to sit back and just, you know, just absorb it. So as I'm going right to left and I hit this hallway, my brain's going, shit, something's wrong here. Because I've got two people now at the end of this hallway that are overlapping one another. I can't yeah. tell who's overlapping who because it was dark. But you can see the people. I could see two blobs basically with the tall head and the short head. And my brain's going, this ain't right. Because generally people run, they hide, or they're there giving up or something. I didn't see any hands. And as I'm getting right here, all of a sudden I see the silver tip of his pistol. And as I come and see it, it's too late. Bam, shot goes off. I can feel it hit my thigh. Um, I returned four shots, boom, 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 boom. I get behind the doorway and I get off center target and I come back around. He had dove into a bedroom at this point, um, shot two in the door frame. And I realized I had my hand pressing on my, on my leg. And I realized this ain't good. Cause it was a lot of blood. I could just feel puddle. Were you hand. worried about the femoral? That's the first thing I said. I said it in the door or right here in the jam. As the other guy's stepping up shooting, I yelled at Mike. I said, dude, I've been hit my femoral. I said femoral instead of femoral. People make fun. I don't know which way it is. <laughs> tomato, tomato. Who cares? And so leave it to cops. That was a big deal for some reason online to people. That Remember I said when your dumbass said femoral? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> love it. So, so I yelled, "Dude, I've been hitting my femoral, femoral," and and 
So my first thought was like, okay, I know you pump out fast. And this is just stupid thinking again when, when you're in these instances. I went, I got to get off my feet because I'm pumping blood out if I'm moving. So I went down on my right hip. I'm still out of the door frame, but I'm kind of angled. And I went down on my right hip and I had my arm extended. I thought, man, I've really been shot. And for a second, I let go of my gun because I'm looking at my leg. And I went, what am I doing? And this is all really quick. You know, yeah. Yeah. I, the shots are still going off. At this point, I had gone like this, my, yep. my, my hearing. So I couldn't hear him, but I knew he was shooting. And I thought, I'm going to get hit in crossfire. What am I doing? I grabbed my gun. And I stood up and I hobbled around behind him. Well, Mike had followed me out. I didn't realize it. So when I get to the curb, that plumbing vein's there in another car, and these are tight spaces. I go to step off the curb as I'm going out, and I'm yelling. Whoever was out there, I think it was my lieutenant at that point, I saw it. I said, I need a tourniquet. I need a tourniquet. I need a tourniquet. I kept just saying that. And I stepped off the curb with my left leg just out of habit, stepping down, and it wasn't working. It, my <laughs> knee buckled, and I went down. Oh, shit. <laughs> so I'm in between this car. I holster my gun. I start butt scooting back. And about that time, he grabs my vest and pulls me around on the other side of that sequoia. That's where yeah. everything took place. And uh, I saw the video of that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, man, I need a tourniquet, dude. I need a tourniquet. And he didn't have one either. He's a lieutenant. You know, fortunately, he even had his gun because lieutenants rarely come out of the office. He's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a super dude. But let's just be honest. I mean, really? So he takes his belt off and he puts it on me. And by that time, Mike had come around and Mike's grabbing it and stepping on my leg and pulling. But there's so much blood. It's just slipping because movies don't work. Belts don't work for tourniquets. Yeah. Just, they yeah. don't. And I'm like, man, I need a tourniquet, dude. You got to get something on this because it's just coming out. And about that time, one of the other guys pops out and he's got one in his hand. And the funniest thing happened. He's standing there with the tourniquet in his hand and he's a little bit frazzled, obviously. And he does this. He sticks it under his arm and he grabs his rubber gloves out and starts to put them on. <laughs> you motherfucker. And I'm like thinking, dude, I ain't got AIDS. Let's roll here, man. That's not the time. Yeah. And my, my lieutenant said, F your, F your gloves. And he grabbed it and he, he put it on. Um, but man, that tourniquet hurts. Let me tell you, getting shot, it hurt, but it's no pain than we've all felt. I mean, yeah, in the, mil in the military, they make you go through like a, what putting, you have to get a tourniquet put you on your leg crank and down. it fucking sucks. Dude, it felt like my leg was going to explode. It was on for about 30, 35 minutes. And, um, so when that took place, you know, they're obviously setting up, they're trying to call him out. And, and then they, they throw me on the back of this car. Once they get the tourniquet on the beat guys show up. Um, they do a little more bandage on it. Where EMS is nowhere to be found. Yeah, I was about to say, we're, we're, <laughs> we're he's jamming away. out and it's a quarter mile at? away. <laughs> and I keep going, man, where's EMS? And they're like, let's right. just throw you in the car and take you. And remember, it's raining. Cops adrenalines are up. We're 20 minutes from the hospital. I'm thinking, okay, they're a quarter mile away. You're going to throw me in the car with your adrenaline pump. We're going to go 100 miles an hour through red lights. You're going to kill us all. I said, no, I'll wait on the ambulance. And I'd always said my whole career, if I get shot, throw me in a car and take me because ambulance is slow. But they're supposed <laughs> right, to be right here, right, yeah. right here. So it takes them a good five, six minutes to get there. I don't know if, again, headphones time. is huge. Yeah. It felt like an Why? hour. I guess you're probably going to get they it. They said they never got the call. The radio said things were mixed up. I think probably headphones are back on. Games are being played. Yeah, movies watched. Dude, just, holy shit. Just zoned out. Um, so they get there. And they come through. So... In the video, you can see there's two entrances to this apartment complex. One has like a 10-foot gate they had closed off because it was next to a residential, and I guess they got tired of the traffic going in and out. So there was only one way in. You had to snake around to get to it. Well, EMS guys didn't know that, so they pulled up to the gate. Well, prior to that, the beat, the first arriving beat car showed up to that gate, and my lieutenant's like, ram it. That's ram right. It. Ramming he boom, speed. Ram through it, and it was great. He loved it. We loved it. You know, <laughs> it, it was just it's one of those movie things that all right, you all yeah. dream of. Yeah. And so... And that guy was super helpful and calm, a new guy. But, dude, you talk about calm. That guy was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I give him all credit. And so, because um, I kept going, man, I think either the bullets lodged or I got shot twice. I knew I'd only heard one shot, but I, my pain was not where I got shot. It was up in my groin and my lower back. And later on, I found it was because of the nerve damage and where it just ripped through the nerves. Um, but, again, he comes up. He's got a knife. They get it cut open. We're looking. Can't find anything. Um, so, finally, EMS pulls up to the gate, and they're like, throw him on the back of the car. They throw me on the trunk, uh, drive me down to the gate. Cause it's a good man. I don't know, 200 meters maybe, uh, to the gate. And I couldn't obviously walk that far. Did you have an exit, an exit wound? Yes. So, so they knew it didn't go and the bullet didn't, didn't start traveling inside you. Right. They didn't know on, on scene. Couldn't find it. Okay. They couldn't even find it in the emergency room for a while. I had to do two CTs. Cause they're like, that's in there somewhere. We can't find an exit. Wound. Oh, wow. Ended up being in the crease of my butt cheek, right? in the, <laughs> not my crack, my crease. Because 
My five year old at the time would tell people, "Yeah, my dad got shot and it came out his butthole." And I was going, Dude, you got to quit telling people it came out my butthole. It did not come out my butthole. Wait, so while you were while you were doing all this and this was all happening, is the scene still active? Oh yeah, like, it's still scene's active. On? People are starting to show up. People are setting up perimeter. Uh, but the shooting's over. Shooting's over. Okay. S- shooting lasted about 12 seconds. From the time that door was breached, he fired till it was complete silence. It was about 12 seconds. He didn't uh, fire after the one shot? No. He okay. shot. The coward shot and dove straight into a room, <laughs> leaving her in the hallway. And, you, you know, they, they praise him on TV as this brave hero protecting his castle. And I'm going, wait a minute. He had a minute to react, to get up, get dressed, get his gun, stand in the hallway and wait. Didn't call 911 like you heard on, on, on the show or on, on the news. Did not call 911. Brought your woman out with you to address a threat if you really thought it was a threat and right. then leave her hanging. Yeah. And so he calls 911 six and a half minutes after the shooting. After he called his mom, then he called 911, then he called Brianna's mom. So almost 17 minutes before he would come out so they could render her aid. What did he, was say, what did he say to the moms? I have no idea. Mm. Yeah, we're, we're not privy yeah, to that. I was going to say, if he said uh, the cops were here, that well, might be. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll send yeah. you a video, you said, if you can plug it in wherever you want. There's a video. So there's a guy named Donovan Duncan, who, who's a police officer. He'd been on about two and a half years at this point, three years. He's the courtesy officer in that apartment, which basically, if you're a courtesy officer in an apartment, you either get a discount or you get it free because you've yeah. got to make the runs in the apartment when they loud noise or hand out whatever. And so he was the courtesy officer in that apartment. When he heard the shots, he turned his radio on, heard a police officer was shot, threw his uniform on, and came down, which he should do. Yeah. Well, the the funny thing is, he went to middle school and high school with Kenneth Walker, the guy that shot me. Okay? So he knows Kenneth's mom. They're friends. They talk to each other on the phone. He see, When he sees him in the apartment complex, they stop mm. and say, hey. Yeah. And so Kenneth did call his mom. And like a good mom, she showed up to the scene. I would. My son called me and said, oh, crap, something just happened. Police are here. Somebody's dead. She shows up. She sees him. She knows him. So she beelines to him and says, hey, I don't know what's going on, but Kenneth called me and said, they're at the door. And I said, who's at the door, baby? And she said, he said, it's the police. I got to go and hung up. Mm. So he did know. He absolutely knew But that wasn't was privy there. to the trial? That wasn't privy like that to the you? investigation, you think it would be yeah. that was never investigated, at least not by any, not by the attorney general or that the DOJ did the FBI investigate it. Won't know. They won't tell us. Hmm. Yeah. It's almost That's like so yeah. crazy. Four phones yeah. found at the scene. All of them had active uh, accounts. Yeah. Brianna's they said they couldn't get into because Pasco protected. Mm-hmm. Kenneth gave his password. They had a warrant on it. They did it. Um, he's in there selling drugs to Hooters girls. Um, there's one text thread talks about his buddies text him and said, Hey man, uh, we're going to hit this lick. Do you want to hit it with us? He said, what's it worth? And they said, 20,000. He said, well, I'll always do my homework first. So was he a, a home invader also? I'm thinking maybe karma's coming back on him, you know, because I don't know about you all, but when we had several reports over the years of people acting like the police at the door. And then when somebody opens the door, man, it's, yeah. you know, the opposite crew coming in, jacking them. So, the other two phones the FBI took possession of, we have no idea what's on them. We don't know the tolls as far as what calls were made to and from them that night. The, um, just a lot of weird cover-up type stuff. Yeah, it's almost like there's the, a narrative. Those phones that you didn't get to see more than likely had his application to to be a doctor or a lawyer right, or, or getting yeah, his life yeah. back on track. And that's what you didn't get to see. And it's, un- right. and it's unfortunate because well, he, he was about to turn it around. He was getting ready to start a job. He was getting ready to turn it around. He was getting ready to start a job. He was getting ready to start a 20 K job. Yeah. <laughs> I start tomorrow. Next Thursday at midnight. John, yeah. was Kenneth Walker at all in any of your brief, like no, briefings? Had no so idea it was existed. a complete surprise. Didn't know he existed. Later on, we found out that the day before, I didn't find this out till like a month before trial, the day before, one of the guys on that squad saw him when they were doing physical surveillance, saw him go in, ran his tags and saw he had a concealed carry license. So we weren't given that information, which was, you know, again, was that just lack of experience on their part? Probably. I don't think there was anything malicious to it. They probably thought, ah, he was just visiting that one time, maybe yeah. picking something up done. Um, so I don't hold that against them, you know, cause there's so many, these things are so fluid and there's so many variables. You never get it hundred percent. Right. Um, so but the other thing is, when he did finally come out after 17 minutes, he said Brianna shot. He 
he put the blame on her. <laughs> I've got that on video too. So this guy, yeah, he's, he's nothing but a coward. If you ask me. Um, and then the city turns around and pays him $2 million for his emotional damage. So that was kind of a kick in the balls there. You well, know, like, we talk about this, uh, me and Brent, we've covered some things where how bad does it make the criminal at like the criminal side of it look on the officers when the civil suit is paid out immediately? Oh, hundred percent. Any juror is going to go, it's well, tainted. Any, yeah. Any juror is going to go, well, if, if the city paid these guys $2 million, then clearly the police did something wrong. Yeah. It's going to put that in their head and, and it shouldn't be allowed. Civil suits should be done. Like they always have been after the criminal. hundred percent. Yeah. That, that totally tainted not only the, the potential jury pool, but it definitely changed the, the way people perceived us. Um, because when this narrative came out, I remember it was only like two or three days into it and it, it all already started. They had the wrong apartment. Oh, it was a no knock. And I'm reaching out to my bosses going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Show the warrant. Yeah. Get ahead of this. All you gotta do is show the cover sheet yeah. that shows her name and address on it. And that's where we were at. Yeah. Defend, said, defend the bullets. It's not hard. You don't have to compromise the integrity of the case to put some of these truths out. Yeah. And they refused to. And their excuse was, we don't want to, um, what was the terminology they use? We don't want to set precedent for future cases. And I said, I told my boss, I went, number one, they change precedent anytime they feel like that benefits them. I said, number two, they'd rather the city burn than to, to, to tell the truth. This makes no sense to me. And later on again, yeah. it, it goes back to that whole gentrification thing. The mayor didn't want anything coming back on him because he set all these wheels in motion. So the, the thing that, after the fact, when you look back and see things, it's kind of like if someone in your family is involved in domestic violence as a victim, you see the signs, but you don't see the signs till afterwards. And you go, yeah. oh, crap, that makes sense now. That's why they did that. I remember every, I think it was Monday, a rep, the, one of the assistant mayors or deputy mayors and three of our colonels would come into the narcotics office and meet with this crew. And they would get them briefed up on the case. And I'm thinking, man, all the years I've done narcotics and violent crime and all the, you know, thousand warrants I've done. Not one time has anybody from the mayor's office showed up asking about a case. Yeah. Not once has Colonel showed up asking about a case. What is going on? Literally. Here? And also every Monday. Yeah. Not just once or they twice. They wanted the update <laughs> no. because in 2017, they had had the university of Kentucky draw out all these elaborate plans for this area for the gentrification. Well, but before we get on to the case, there's, there, there's something I, I definitely want to dig into because if, uh, if, if, if anyone watched the NFL during this time or the hmm. NBA or, anything. or, or anything, matter. they knew that this was something people really got behind Brianna Taylor, right. her as a person, she was a, she was a, she was a nurse. She was this wonderful woman. You know, you guys were, were murderers that had no business doing what you did. And they basically, you know, they, they, she was, they made a saint out of her. Right. So who was Brianna Taylor? All right. Well, and I always preface this. I'm not bashing her because personally, I think she's a victim of circumstance in this, in this sense. Okay. She's responsible for whatever crimes she commit or anything that she was involved in. But we know from dealing with this, that these predators, the dealers look for these women who are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They look for her dad was in prison her whole life. Her mom didn't raise her. Her grandma did. So this girl was probably looking for love, looking for acceptance. Uh, Jamarcus had several girlfriends, baby mama, and she was one of them. So he's using different ones to hold different stuff, to move things around. And she's just a pawn in his game thinking that he's in love. Yeah. Right. And they use these women. And so she's in that situation. Again, she's responsible for whatever she does at the, at, after that point. But she wasn't a nurse, never was. She was an EMT for five months, never got off probation. She, she was, was never a nurse? No. I don't know why I'm acting surprised that they lied. <laughs> no, in 2016, <laughs> she applied to be an EMT. She got accepted. She went through the schooling. The picture you see of the decorated EMT, she went decorated. That was her diploma for graduating <laughs> EMT school. And so she did that. And while she was on probation, she ended up getting fired with a no hire, no rehire clause Damn, in oh, the wow. city's file. Uh, they wouldn't release the whole file because they said she was no longer an employee, even though they released all of ours and any, right. any dirt they can find, yeah. they, they pile on. Um, I, I, in early 2017, she rented a car that a body was found in, shot in the head, who was an associate of Jamarcus Glover's, who apparently had they had gotten into some beef. Um, and when they asked her about it, she was like, well, I don't know. I didn't have the car. Jamarcus took it or somebody took it. I don't know. 
So that was kind of the thing. And then there was some Wait, other. So there was a, there was an execution style murder in a car that she rented. Correct. And wow. And you never hear about it. Yeah, no, that's first hearing about yeah. that. Holy yeah. guacamole. I did hear, and I, and I hate to, uh, again, put in some sort of uh, rumor into this. Maybe, you know, maybe you don't that uh, I did know she was fired from uh from emt at least she was running uh ambulances Correct. if if i and someone uh put out that she was running drugs out of the ambulance and that's what that's what she got fired for yeah, but there's I, no official word on that it, so i can't say yes or no but okay you, you know the game she was it's, in so fill in whatever you want yeah, I, hey, the, the, i don't want to get sued over this, something stupid <laughs> regardless this saying is absolutely true uh, you know, which is show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are. Yeah. She's absolutely uh, somewhat of a victim here, but she knew exactly who she was oh, yeah. running There's around no with. She was Both protecting them. Dope. She was, she was supporting them. She was a part of it. Yeah. And so, you know, you, yeah, you the play jail, stupid games, you win stupid The prizes. jail calls, talk, Jamarcus Glover's talking to his baby mom after the fact. And she says, where's all your money at? And he said, well, I gave, I think it was 14,000 debris to hold for me, but she holds all of our money. And so, you know, all this stuff's on tape. It's all documented, but nobody wanted to hear the truth, Mm -hmm. you know, because of sensationalism. And, and unfortunately had this happened in 2022, 2014, 2012, you probably wouldn't have heard much about it, but because of 2020 with all the, you know, you had Breonna Taylor in March, you had Ahmaud Aubrey in April, and then you had George Floyd in May. Ben Crump was the attorney on all these. So he (laughs) conflated. Ben Crump. There he is I can't stand it, dude. That bumbling (laughs) Saka, you know, so he conflated all these incidents as white guys attacking black people and hunting them down and killing them when each case was totally different. And you can have your thoughts on any of these cases, but they're not the same, not related at all. The only, the only relation is the attorney. And, uh, <laughs> and that should tell you right. something. Yeah. I should tell you all you need to know. Can I yeah. tell you something? Yeah. If, if Ben Crump is watching this right now <laughs> over the weekend, 109 people shot in Chicago, 19 fatally. Say their name. 109 people shot in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Let that sink in. Right. Ben Crump yeah. is nowhere to be found. Yeah. And there's no money to be and, made. And neither is the NFL anywhere to be found. Yep. The NBA, the WNBA. LeBron whoever. James hasn't made a statement right. yeah. about being devastated for 109 people shot over yeah. the weekend in Chicago. Confirmed. Yep. Just 19 looking dead. for a little consistency it's crazy. here. Crazy. This is, that's not a, that's this, is, this is Chicago. Yeah, that's that's a lot zone. of football helmets to put names on, man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and shoes and dedicating seasons. So, and you're going to Tampa kneeling. Bay Bucks and the, and the and the whatever your yeah. baseball team is, the the Rays. They put their opening day as uh, rest the murders that killed Breonna yeah. Taylar and yeah. all and this stuff. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Florida. That's, that's why I couldn't watch any sports after that. And uh, every time I, I would oh. turn a game on trying to get away from the crazy news – our faces showed up or our names came up or that situation right. came up. And I was like, man, screw this. I'm done. With I, I, I stopped watching the NFL when they started putting these guys' names on their helmets. I, I, just, I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, was it justice for Brianna. Was, was that like the, I believe the, the slogan they had that and say her name, those two say her name. Yeah. What's say her name came out. I think was the bland case back in 14. It just kind of got reinvigorated in 2020. Mm-hmm. We're saying it in 2024. <laughs> That's it. Truthfully though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not the way, not the way they want to hear it. No, because they don't want to know the truth. They, no, don't they don't care about the truth. They have an agenda. Whenever whatever lines up with their agenda, and they'll run with it because they know the media isn't going to fact check them right. or, or or say differently. And, and here we go. We're gonna have another episode that that gets me riled up. <laughs> these, these stories just they kill me. Yeah, it's it, it was definitely a miscarriage of justice. And you know things could have been done different. You know people go well. Why were you at Brianna Taylor's house to begin with? Okay, fair question, right? If Jamarcus Glover's a dope dealer and he's 10 miles away, why were you there? Well, the investigation led them there because his ID had her address. His bank account had her address. His phone was registered to her address and her name. Um, Did I say his vehicle? His vehicle was registered there. In January of 2020, he was locked up with seven weapons, uh, heroin, cocaine, weed. She bailed him out. She paid for it and put her address and number phone number as his since he lived at her place. So everything pointed there. So that's do, the reason they were there. So how does he have a concealed carry? He event? didn't. No, no, no. That's the other boyfriend. The other boyfriend. The other boyfriend. Yeah. Let's not get him confused. The one Gosh. that shot me had the concealed carry, not the other one. Marcus. Yeah. Yes. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The millionaire. Oh, so so Brianna, <laughs> Brianna had two boyfriends. Yes and no. They won't say so, but yeah, he was in and out. Brianna. I, I believe they both settled. They both settled uh, for 2 million. Who's the other? Jamarcus Glover. No, 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 no. No, they, yeah. no, they end up 
pleading his charges and dropping them and saying, if you promise to move back to Miss, uh, I think it was Mississippi, then <laughs> he's, he's in prison now. Then yeah, we're he still got, trying then, to gentrify we'll the area, by the way. So if you could get well, out of here, the city got those houses, by the way. They took them. Um, well, they paid for them one way or another. Yeah. Yes. JV team for life. What's up, everybody? I want to give a quick shout out to Zero Nine Holsters, ruggedized equipment, proudly made in America for cops by cops. This Ohio-based company uses injected molded plastics and Codex Thermoform material, which makes it super easy and convenient to clean all of the bodily fluids you come into contact with on your shift. They got radio holsters, BWC holsters, pistol and AR, mag holsters, pepper spray, handcuffs and flashlight holsters, and various canine equipment holsters. The ruggedized case allows for a quick draw of your equipment without the fumbling around when returning to a shapeless holster. Head over to 09holsters.com and use promo code 09 antihero 10 for 10% off your order. That's 09 antihero 10 for 10% off your order. Revenge is an act of passion. Vengeance is an act of justice. Injuries are revenged. Crimes are avenged. Almost a century ago, big pharmaceutical companies re-engineered medical school curriculum and faculty with one goal, putting profit before progress. Anyone pushing back against the medical matrix they carefully crafted was threatened, silenced, censored, financially ruined, or worse. They are the problem. We are the solution. Uh, you're clear to engage initial mic to get alpha. You're clear to engage with weapons. You're clear to engage with weapons. JV team for life. So Jamarcus, he had like, I think it was six felony cases open at the time for guns and drugs and was just rotating. Had he been in jail, wow. none of this would have happened. You know, if the justice system had been just. There's another great point. None yeah. of this would have happened. Um, so, you know, you can put blame, but where does it stop? Because it goes right. all the way to the top, both in yeah. the justice system and the city. Right. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, we were kind of victims in that, too. Oh, yeah. I remember when I sat down with Strahan doing 2020 and Good Morning America, you know, we, we talked for uh, three hours straight, no break, just bam, bam, bam. He came in and was just firing away like a defense attorney. And you could tell he was, you know, he emotionally was invested. Oh, yeah. 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 And yeah. finally, I looked at him at one point and went, man, let me ask you this. I was shot. My, I had a, a hit taken out of my family by Brianna's mom and her motorcycle club. We had to move. Whoa. We've lost our jobs. We've Come lost the money. That. I said, am I a victim in any of this? I said, that's fine if you want to say Brianna was a victim, but am I a victim in any of this? He went, mm. I went, you just said it. You don't think so. I said, so I know where you stand and you know where I stand. And so just that thought process of, man, we're going to glorify these guys and girls that live in this illegal realm and not praise or at least see the side of, of, of the point of the people who are trying to make society safer just boggles my mind. Well, you'd think Strahan would understand this premise a little bit. Uh, he had some allegations oh, yeah. thrown against him. Oh, and I asked him about it. I the, said, well, you, I said, yeah, man, yeah, do you remember? I said, you remember when you went through your first divorce? I said, your wife put those allegations out about you abusing her and stuff. You said that to him? Oh, yeah. Is that, that's on air? No. They oh. cut it off. <laughs> they took, Pull they, that clip. They took three <laughs> hours and, and cut it down to about six minutes, and it was the worst. They yeah. they changed things around and made it yeah. look like, and we were, we did go at it a couple of times because he's claiming the victim of, oh, I'll get into this one in a minute, too. It's, it's I, a I love joke, that you asked me that. I love that you did your homework. Yeah. Maybe you knew that before. No, I did from, my homework. You I did looked, your homework. Yeah, oh, yeah. The what 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 was his answer to that? He's like, oh, I didn't like it. I went, well, you're doing the same <laughs> thing to me. It just right. makes no sense. And so, yeah. uh, and then he he brought up the fact, man, do you think there's? I think you know racial profiling is real. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I said we criminal profile, but there's not racial profiling. I said, <laughs> I like sure, that. some guys right. may do it, hundred percent. You know, you might get in some podunk town and they might do it. Who knows? I said, but I can tell you, I've never in in my twenty years seen somebody go, oh, there's a black guy, let's stop him. And I've seen it the other way, so maybe racial profiling does exist because. We live right there with Indiana. Indiana and, and, and Louisville, they butt up to each other by, by a river. And when you would see the white dude from Indiana in the west end of Louisville, which is where all the majority of the dope's being sold. He's buying crack. He's buying dope. <laughs> That's who we'd stop, not the black dude. We'd stop the white dude from Indiana and yeah. always get dope off of him yeah. or warrants or something like that. But no one had a problem with that, did they? No. Because, no again, again, but – you might say it's racial profiling because he's white in a black right. neighborhood, but it's criminal profiling because you know why he's there. Right. And once you do something long enough, he's like, well, how can you tell? I'm like, dude, you played NFL how many years? I said, in your position, you got to, you knew people. 
You studied them. You knew if they're faking right, left, or a guy has a certain move, you get a that's feel right. for the game. Yeah. So you knew how to play it. And that's what made you so good. I right. said, it's no different than policing. You get a feel for things in the area you work and you know what's supposed to happen and what's not. And when things are out of place, you just, and you put all those factors together and that's how you make stops. He said, well, I was, I've been racially profiled. I'm, oh yeah. Tell me the story. He said, uh, I was pulled over once in a black man in a nice car. And he said, you know what pissed me off? And I said, what? He said, the guy walked up to me and he saw who I was and go, oh, Strahan, I'm a fan. And he didn't give me a ticket. And I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, <laughs> He's a victim. He said I was speeding. I wasn't speeding. I went, do you ever speed? He went, no. I went, man, you're lying. I said, we all speed. I sped on the way here. I, I said, <laughs> I've been pulled over many times as a cop. I've gotten tickets as a white cop for speeding. I said, <laughs> How many other times have you been pulled over? None. I went, wait a minute. Well, you're 51 years old. You've been pulled over one time and didn't get a Don't ticket. And, let go. and there's racial profiling taking place. Yeah. So, <laughs> man, get on, out of Michael. here with this stuff. So man, dude, that's you, the, had, you had his number on oh, that, yeah. uh, <laughs> that interview. Yeah. That's just the kind of did stuff he, you're dealing with. Did he ever acknowledge that? No, we moved on. Uh, yeah, no. just straight moved on. He, he Anytime you point facts and, and yeah. truths to these people, they deflect and go to a different Well, you're very, were you, you're very articulate and well-spoken now, but you have done a lot of like media and stuff, but were you like you are now there? Cause I, they don't get people like you. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, didn't <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. I, I mean, I felt fine. I, felt, I mean, I, I felt mean, like oh, we're talking here is what here's it felt the like. Thing. They brought, I know what it is. They brought in a guy that's defended himself in court on criminal cases multiple times. So you know how to effectively communicate when somebody's wrong. Right. And you stop them and then you push the what actually happened, but you have to do it respectively. Right. You can't the defense attorney can't scream at him and knife hand him and call him an idiot. So you have to make him feel like an idiot. Right. I mean I mean if I've taken I've taken several interview and interrogation courses and that helps. Because <laughs> you can kind of pick apart where people are are, are deflecting or not telling yeah. the complete truth or or trying to make it something it's not. Did did you guys uh, end the three hour interview cordially? We did. Everything? Man, when it was yeah, over, yeah. he said he actually said this. Okay, the words that came out of his mouth were, "Man, I like you, except that you're a Cowboys fan." Because I told him I was a Cowboys <laughs> fan, knowing that the Giants and the Cowboys just and I have been my whole life, so it's not a lie. Yeah, fuck and, you, Michael. Sign this for me. And so, well, <laughs> <laughs> he said, <laughs> my wife's aunt is a huge or was a huge Strahan fan. And I said, yeah, I said, right. if this yeah. is inappropriate, cool, no big deal. I said, but my wife's aunt. Ask for an autograph. We give one. He signed one. So the next morning, he gets on on the air and just dogs me. Yeah, I mean, just just total about face. And everybody was mad. I'm like, you know what? I kind of get it. We're in 2020. He will get canceled. Lose, That's right. Lose his job. Lose yeah, lose if this. He, gig. If, if he went back, if right. he went back and said, I think he had some good points. Yeah. You know, that right. wasn't what they wanted him to do. Absolutely. So when he got on there and did that, never I, I asked her aunt, I said, you want this autograph? She said, throw it away. I can't stand it, dude, no. <laughs> and I went, eh, it's not like that. You know, whatever. I don't just, I, I seriously, I don't hold a grudge for him. It, it, you right. know, I don't, I think he didn't have the courage to tell the right thing. Yeah. But I, that yeah. doesn't make me dislike the man. Uh, me me and Brent getting into this realm, we've realized that, you know, it. you have to, it's not have a narrative, but people expect certain things and if you go and you go we're wrong and you move on it's just different and you want to be entertaining and there's been things where like should we cover it because it's not like the most honorable thing to call somebody out and then we wait it and then we realize everybody wants to see it so we have to do it in our own way yeah so i can kind of see how that plays i mean like you said he would they'd find another co-host quick oh yeah he, you know yeah he wouldn't survive that if you went and said actually rob o'neill's not a bad dude everybody'd be like what the fuck brent I've said that. I've said he's not a bad dude. I've said okay. he's an American if you hero. Said, if you said, I believe his story now. Oh, yeah. Completely different. <laughs> right. John, what about um, the same pattern that we've seen almost in every police shooting? How, how did the agency throw you on? Did they throw you on, throw you guys under the bus? Oh. What, how did they handle dude, it? Dude, it was, that was the thing that caught me the most off guard, right? I expected the media. I expected the community. <laughs> right. But I thought we did the right thing. We did what they trained us to do what they asked us to do and then what they sent us to do. All right. We're telling you, go here and do this. Here's the equipment to do it. Here's how we trained you to do it. Go do it. We did exactly like they asked. And then when things blew up suddenly, well, I'm sure it's like this in all, all big cities, but I can only speak for Louisville. Our mayor's office totally ran our police department. All right. Our number yeah. two, Ellen Hessen um, was, was the, the number two right behind the mayor. She was in all the meetings with the chief. If the chief spoke up and said, I think we're going to do this. She go, no, you're doing this. He go, okay. Just yep. the puppet he is. They'll, because they'll find another chief. Yeah. yeah it's all it's political at that point. Yeah. It's yeah. all political. It's not they're, they're not really police officers. Yeah. yeah. 
And so um, when I talked to the chief the day after he came to the hospital room, I told him the entire story. I shouldn't have because, <laughs> you know, it can be used against you if, if you've done something wrong. But I knew for some reason everything was recorded like a, like a, a DVD in my head. And I'm like, I didn't do anything wrong, so I'll tell the truth. I don't care. I'll give my statement right now. I don't care. I agree with that. And, and so I told him everything. And, oh, I'm sorry. You know, we talked for like two hours. He left the room. Um, after that, I didn't talk to him again. I talked to one person from the chief's office after that day, one time. And halfway during that conversation, oh, I, I got to go. And he hung up. And, and so that level of support, zero, not a bit. Um, I like our FOP guys, but it was weak. Um, everybody thinks FOPs run cities. That's a bunch of bull. Well, the FOP just in general is losing power every day to defend cops. So, yeah, I mean, and, and a lot of people, the FOP back in the day, especially up in the Northeast, the cop got fired. They were getting their job back. The FOP had a lot of power and a lot of people would disagree with the cops actions. What, not one in particular, but sometimes things would happen and, and everybody would be like, Ugh. but the FOP would get their job back, which really put a bad taste in any, anybody that's liberal or, or seemingly anti-cop were like, these guys are a bunch of mafiosos getting these cops rehired. That's, that's how they are. And so chiefs and sheriffs and administrations have been all across the country. That's been their prerogative is to weaken them, to take away the power of the FOP. Yeah. And, and I know some great FOP guys across the nation that I've gotten to know since then. And some of them are still hammering down, doing a good job the best they can. With the limitations they've now been given. We had a guy come on the show. It was right before um, we merged, me and Brent. Um, and he's a president of the one down here. And he oh, said, just with them. Yeah. yeah. And he said, um, you know what? Our best, the only thing we can do is have a good rapport with admin because they make the final call. We can't do anything. However, if we have a mutual respect for each other, a good rapport, our best way to defend our cops is to have that sheriff go, all right, I trust you. But he could at any time go, actually, never mind. So, yeah. So, did that, the, the, the chief, it it's, seems like it's clear to say he didn't come out and wasn't a, uh, a supporter of you guys and a defender of you guys. No, the only time he came out and gave any kind of type of support yeah. was when they dropped the charges on Kenneth Walker. Okay. Um, well, he he well, actually came well, out and gave a statement on that. Right. Which, at, at, um, but that's after the Yeah, this way down the road. It, right. Yeah. Did he the, do the time he needed to didn't take place? It was too late. So he was an empty suit. So, uh, so clearly he didn't do anything for you. Did he do anything against you, you know, actively against you, or he was just an just, empty suit? Just empty. Yeah. Yeah. Just quiet. And, and that speaks so much more volumes than actually saying anything against you. Um, because the time you need a voice, because we, we can't have a voice. Yeah. That's it. You're our voice. Right. Yeah. He's your mouthpiece. Yeah. And when, yeah. and when they refuse to do it, then you're sitting back going, man, what, you're on an island. You yeah. know, they threw all of us on an island. We it's were scary. just, we were just gone. And He's, it was we like, we talked about with Yusuf and his situation. Oh it's, man. You know, you're horrible. On your own. Horrible. Your Yusuf. friends are kind of like, Hey man, you, you doing okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, know? the funny thing is I remember when, when they charged Brett, the guy who shot through, through the side windows and people ask about that. Let me give you a breakdown on that real quick. Yeah. Yeah. So when we're at the door and I shoot and Brett's the third one coming up. So you can't get three guys in a doorway, right? Right. As I go back, Miles steps up and and he's shooting down the hall to his perceived threat because he wasn't sure who shot. He just saw the flash and there's still somebody there, right? So, man, the threat's still in front of him in his eyes. He's shooting. I'm getting out of the way as I'm doing that and said, man, I've been shot. Brett can't get up. He saw the original flash. He saw the shot. He knew I was shot and he heard gunshots. He button hooked around the front of the building. And when he got around there, the echo from inside this, this echo chamber here yeah. was boom, 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 boom. He thought we're getting gunned down at the door. Yeah. That's what he thought. He didn't know I'd gotten out, followed behind him. He didn't know. He knew Miles was still there. And he heard these rapid shots and he thought, man, they're getting executed at the door. So he started putting rounds through the window where he perceived they might be just to get him to quit shooting. Right. His bullets little, didn't little hit anybody. Suppressive fire. Yeah. Which isn't legal. <laughs> yeah. But again, is it is it immoral? Is it is it worthy of being federally charged for uh, a civil rights violation, which is potential life in prison when you hit no one? You know, with all the crap we see going on in, in the in, in the other side of it. But oh, well, he was right. charged federally. Well, he was charged statewide. He went through that court, got acquitted. Okay. Nice. The Fed in the room walked behind him after they read it and said, "This ain't over." Are you kidding me? No. Walked out. Ugh. They brought charges up on him. 
We went through that trial. It was a hung jury, 10 to acquit, two, to, two for guilty. And they're retrying him again this October. Gosh. Damn. Now on federal charges. Still on federal charges, yeah. They wouldn't let it go. No. And they're going to they're gonna see it through until they get what they, they want. Get, yeah, they what's want a, a piece of flesh, it, what's, man. What's something that if this video were to get, I don't know, if this video were to get 20,000 views, 20,000 people, what's something that 20,000 people could do towards the federal government? Anything? I don't know if anything we can do for the federal government. Anybody, they, can, they can write their, their senators or their, their congressmen, but again, those people are pretty weak too, as far it, as I'm concerned. Would it help Brett, if we Brett, rioted? Brett Hankinson. Brett Hankinson. H-A-N-K-I-S-O-N. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. So his life, you know, my life's been turned upside down, but his, dude, he's been on hold for four years now. Can this, you imagine that hanging over your head after two trials and still going through it? Yusuf can. I mean, this, yeah, <laughs> this man right here, this victim can. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, and what's the recourse for that? What's what's the retribution if he gets cleared? Here's what's unreal. Kills me. They get their way through mob mentality yep. by doing the wrong thing. Doing what? Let's just be honest. What we won't. What could we do? Well, 20,000 people could get together and burn a city down yeah. and start doing We've that. We've seen that happen, haven't we? Yeah. And, and we would be charged, and, right? That's right. And, <laughs> appara- and apparently get listened to and move the needle. So you could do that. It's not what I'm advocating for. I was going to say, please. <laughs> that is, I'm being facetious, but you know, I'm bringing up a point. You know, it's, So it's crazy. What what could be done, we, we won't do. No. And, but because and, we're normal, civilized people. Is your it's, governor pro or? Anti. anti no, okay. no. My governor. This is during COVID, right? Yeah. And so he's doing his little briefings every couple of days on TV. Two different occasions, he allowed Breonna Taylor's family, her attorneys, and on one occasion, the 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 crazy leftist uh, until freedom group from New York by, by Tamika Palmer or Tamika Parrish, whatever her name is, Tamika something, Mallory, Tamika Mallory. She got on there and and in his podium on TV going. Oh, they're racist. They're kill. They're murderers. They should go to prison. They should lose their pension. The governor saying on the this. on the governor's platform with him standing in the background. Or yeah, I mean, on yeah, 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 yeah. The, at the governor's meeting. Yeah, they're saying. This. And the mayor of allowed, Kentucky of Kentucky. The you, mayor allowed the same thing. He's a Democrat. What are you? What are you doing? I know Kentucky? we're not political here, but Kentucky. He's Democrat. What are you doing? Yeah, right. Yeah. Kentucky. Of all then he way. got reelected. It was awesome. Of course, yeah. well, let's reward that. Yeah, and and it's funny because our attorney general is black. And he actually did the right thing. He had Beyonce writing letters, putting them in the New York Post. He had Jennifer Lawrence, George Clooney, all these people putting pressure on him going, oh, lock these guys up, do all this stuff. And all the black people going, oh, you're, you're, you're black folk, but you ain't kin folk. And you're an Uncle Tom if you don't lock them up and all this stuff. And he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, I'm, go- I'm required to go by the letter of the law. If these guys broke the law, we'll charge them. If they didn't, we won't. And that's what he did. And man, he caught unbelievable hell and racism from his own group. Did they replace him? Well, he ran for governor and he lost. And, uh, and I feel bad because he had already, his name was kind of already in the arena. That was kind of the path he was taking. Yeah. And then he got stuck in the middle of this crap because he was, he was popular. He really was. And for, and and I'd say this, but for a black guy to get that high in Kentucky, we're a little bit behind everybody on the race stuff. So, you know, he was there and and he was moving up and Take, take the Eddie Gallagher approach. When we said, hey, you know what, that, that medic that kind of fucked you all those years and he, and he told the truth, you know, you, you, you feel like, you know, you owe him. He goes, I don't owe anybody shit. He did the right thing. <laughs> yeah, he did yeah, the right thing. I, I'm right sitting thing. here doing yeah. the right thing, getting destroyed. He at least did the right thing and stopped it. Well, you know? my conscience might be a little bigger. I feel, or my, my empathy <laughs> might be a little bigger. I feel bad if I, if I took a part in derailing this man's career because yeah. he's a good guy. That, yeah. That's the point of that. Yeah. The, uh, he did oh, the right thing he should have. So that's what, what he was elected to do, so. What did Brett get charged with? Would, that would, Locally would be, wanton endangerment on the state level. Okay. Federal level, it's the wanton endangerment charge. I don't know what it's called. It's called some weird thing. But then they added uh, uh, a civil rights violation on top of it, which it does not fit the elements of civil rights violation. Right. But they added it. How they and again, that's those potential dots. life in prison for hurting no one. God, it's, it's unbelievable. Dude. Sounds like a good... Uh candidate for maybe a donald trump pardon if he comes back Gosh. i would hope so well we'll, we'll see how we'll see how that, definitely, that plays out uh kamala and uh our president you know they spoke on these things multiple times on on how yeah we saw the kamala harris one yeah it was the other one was in the debate in 2016 biden got up there and said some stupid so stuff so you got were you terminated no no i was not so right. my first day back to work i come in and i'm the i'm the height of coordinator for narcotics um, 
I'm over our, our task for different things. This is after the state investigation of the shooting. Correct. Ended. It was right. over. I was finally allowed to come back to work. My first day in, I walk in, my major calls me in the office. He slides a piece of paper across his desk and says, sorry, man. I pick it up. I read it. And it says involuntary transfer to the property room. And I'm like, <laughs> I looked at him and I went, yo, I'm trying to slow down, but not this way. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I'm like, what is this about? He said, man, wow. out of my control. Out of my control. I love it. I love so it. I'm like, God, I hate cops like that. All right. There's is nothing it? I can do about it, yeah. man. All you, right. You I passed said, it well, on to him. I said, well, um, I'm taking some vacation time. I'm going to think about it. And I went and put my retirement papers yeah. in. Because I, I saw the writing on the wall. This is after I had done the stray hand interview without their permission. So I knew they were gunning. Yeah. Because oh. the mayor had already got on TV and said, if I could fire them all, I would. But they're protected by the police officer's bill of rights, and I can't. So he had already he had already... He had already put his side out what he was going to do, uh, and that's where it was. Um, Kudos to you, by the way, for having the balls to go on there and do the right thing and defend your point when it really doesn't benefit you. You probably knew going on that show that they're not going to go, oh, okay, never mind. And it was uh, you went on there doing the right thing. It, and it's like a lot of cops, I give them shit because they'll start podcasts and they'll start talking the talk after their retirement. Mm. because they don't want to risk it. Right. You know, it's smart, but you know, well, the thing I tell people when I go speak now, you've got to be your biggest advocate because nobody's going to do it for you. Yeah. They're not, they're just not going to do it. Everybody's protecting themselves, self-interest. Mm -hmm. um, some things I understand, some things I go, that's your job. Yeah. As a leader, if you're a real leader, which there's very few leaders in this, in this field anymore, if you're a leader, you're going to step up for your guy and do the right thing. And, and yeah. people just won't. So you've got to be your own advocate or nobody will be. True. Excuse me. You can Here, here's something uh, I feel like you, you you skimmed over and uh, the death threat. The death threat. Yeah, I was yes. ask you. All right. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Did you just say Brianna Taylor's mom was in a motorcycle club <laughs> yeah. and put out a hit on you? Yeah. So wait, <laughs> <what>? <laughs> I feel like that's the movie adaption. It is, dude. This thing could be a three part movie. All the little intricate things that nobody knows about. Rough Riders. This place. Oh. Close. Straight riders. Uh, it'd be tough though because they'd they'd want no haters and straight riders with two. They'd they'd, they'd want to change you out for a black man, but but they can't because because, they because of the shooting. So yeah, the so they'll never make a movie. Yeah, now. you're right. Denzel yeah. will never play me. <laughs> Denzel will play. <laughs> I love Denzel by the way. Uh, so so in April um, of 2020, I get a I get a phone call. I said, man, there's some threats coming in to our narcotics detectives from their informants. Two different ones going, hey, um, Brianna's mom's part of this motorcycle club. And it's a known club in Louisville. It's known for violence and drugs and guns, um, mm -hmm. shooting people. You know, they, it's the typical black motorcycle gang. Not your not your get-together guys that just want to have a cigar and have a good time. They're, right. they're, 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 a, criminal one, activity. they're a one percenter club. Yeah, criminal activity. Not lawyers in leather jackets. No. <laughs> yeah. So in, in, in my mind, when, you know, he sent me a copy of the text and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, man, I've dealt with informants for 15 years at this point. I'm thinking, I know how informants are. If they tell you it's going to be a pound, it might be an ounce. If they say there's 10 guns, there might <laughs> right. be one. So is this guy, are these people just kind of hearing work mumblings on the street, word on the street and going, Hey man, watch out. Yeah. Now they're giving pretty good details. This is how they're going to do it. And they listed them. And I'm like, and they use my name. Have you yeah. moved yet? No, I hadn't oh, moved yet. Okay. Didn't know. Didn't know I needed to. I mean, I knew the, the potential. <laughs> right. I knew the potential. Yeah. You could feel the storm building up because this is before yeah. George Floyd. This is okay. before everything just exploded. And so I thought, okay. So they put, they gave us some security. They weren't going to at first. They were like, nah, we're not giving them security. And a buddy of mine who was uh, the sergeant over dign dignitary protection, great guy, I love him, Tom Chardon. He put this, this letter together to the department basically saying, you've got these threats in hand and you're refusing to protect your own. You're liable now. Yeah. You know, he's a smart guy. So nice. he knew how to work. Good chess move. Yes. Yep. He sent it to him and they were like, okay, your guys can do it. His that's all admin knows how to do is read CYA. Yes. That's it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Maybe okay. that's just be the Why, title buddy? of all my emails when I sent them. If I'd have known, <laughs> this will help you. Yeah. This helps you. So, uh, we had some bodies on us, but it was kind of loose. You know, they'd sit on the end of our streets and, and incognito stuff, which is what you want. You don't want somebody in your house. And, then on May 31st, so so the, the riot started May 27th. That's when everything just exploded in Louisville. Everything went haywire. I'm in my garage. We just moved in this new house. Um, and I'm putting some stuff together. It's 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday night. I get a call from a guy that used to work for me who's now been up at the Joint Terrorism Task Force and the FBI for five years. 
And he goes, hey, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm just organizing some stuff, putting it away. And he said, um, I hate to tell you this, but man, you need to find somewhere to go. He said, uh, Brianna Taylor's mom, that motorcycle club, there's been corroborated threats now from informants that they're taking a hit out on you guys and they've already paid for it. And her birthday is June 5th, which was that next Friday. And they're doing a big balloon release and they want to have something to celebrate besides her birthday Holy being the shit. death of one of you all or her family. Yeah. And I was it like, got real. Yeah. I'm like, man, what's the source of this? I thought it was just those two informants. He said, now there's another one. So the ATF unbeknownst to us had an OSA death case already on that club. They already had an informant planted in there. What's OS- OSADEV? Um, it's the federal, I can't remember the the, the, the terminology for it. Uh, you know oh, that? shit. Here we go. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> um, it's spelled weird. O-C-E-D-F-T or T-F. And so this, this informant had already been buying guns from this club for the ATF. Now, is the ATF tracking the threats on your family yet? What they didn't know about them. Okay. This informant comes forward and goes, hey, I don't want anything for this. I'm just letting you know. And they give the exact same rundown that these other informants get, and they don't yeah. know each other. Right. Oh. The other ones were kind of hanger honors to the club. This person's in the club. Yeah, now it's dual sourced. Yes. Yeah. The Office of Situational Awareness? I don't know. <laughs> Office of Homeland Security Situational I just Awareness. Know, yeah. I just know that's where we got our funds when we were doing big cases Office with the Office of Homeland feds. Security situ- Situational Awareness. Okay. Yeah. They fund they fund operations when you're doing investigations. That's where the money Holy comes from. Holy shit, the feds did something effective. All right. <laughs> and so <laughs> and so when this took place, she reached out to they reached out to the, the the female handler and said, This is what's going on. They bring him into the FBI. They give basically the same scenario. She said, I was there when um Sin City from Chicago came in. They had a Durango, a Taurus some other vehicle and two motorcycles. They came in, they met with the president, the vice president of the club, Brown Taylor's mom's part of the club. She's dating the vice president. She was there and this person was there. And they were like, they talked about how they wanted to do it. They could do it just at a stoplight. They could rig a bomb up on a car. They could do all these different things. And so they paid them the money. They went back to Chicago. And so she comes to her handler. They go to the FBI. The FBI brings them in and then the FBI starts doing what the FBI does. Okay. Now you're our informant, not, not mm-hmm. your handlers. And she's like, no, man, I've been with this handler yeah. for years. I'm not, I don't want you. Yeah. And so then they go, and this is after, let me backtrack a little bit. So when, when Scott calls me and says, this is what's going on. I said, Scott, when, if anything comes down, don't reach out and tell me about it. I don't want to, Two years down the road, if we're in trial, it to come up that you were given information when you shouldn't have. I said, now, if my family's in threat, if there's an imminent threat, let me know. Other than that, I want to stay out of it. Don't tell me what warrants are being written. None of that. He said, cool. About four days into it, he calls me and goes, man, something's weird happening here. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, the bosses from downstairs are now coming under our floor asking questions about this case. And they're talking about the optics of it. It looks bad going after a national victim's mom. And I'm thinking, oh I said, God. what do optics have to do with taking hits out on cops? Right. With What does optics have to do with criminal activity? Yeah. And he's like, man, I don't know. I said, well, keep me updated. A couple of days later, he calls back and says, well, I just got into it with one of the big bosses here. And uh, they've now kicked me off the floor, revoked my key card, and said I'm not allowed to talk to the, the case agents. Okay. Same thing happened. They came in and were like, man, we, we really shouldn't do this case. We shouldn't push forward. Ten days into it. He calls me back and says, you're not going to believe it. They, they've locked the case. They've taken it from. Now, the two agents that were working it, or three, whatever it was, were like hard charging, wanting F- to do the right thing. FBI, right? Yeah, okay. FBI. Wanting to do the right thing. They were pissed that they took the case from them, locked it up. Wouldn't let anybody. Can't work anymore. And so I'm like, man, there's no way. This is crazy. So, man, I had my crazy. attorney starting to reach out. Yeah. I reached out to the department, sending emails, copying people going, I need, I need information. Is Because... At this point, now she's got her 12 million bucks plus her eight and a half million from GoFundMe. So that little $50,000 take a hit out on the cops means nothing now when you got a pocket full of money and go, okay, make it really happen. Yeah. Her mom got 12 million bucks from the city and eight and a half million from GoFundMe. She didn't even raise her. <laughs> and I'm assuming because she couldn't get a baby seat on the motorcycle. Is that maybe why? You man, you're trying to put another hit on my head, aren't you? <laughs> Brianna didn't make the cut for the motorcycle club. <laughs> she didn't pass probationary. This 
this whole story yeah. is it just it makes me more upset. Wait, so okay, ter- to Tarantino, this I'm assuming <laughs> nobody was charged for something that they should go to prison Absolutely. for. Absolutely, not even investigated. But the, so murder this, for hire, not investigated on a cop, yeah. on three cops and their families. Yeah, it wasn't just me. I'm not the only one here. There was the other guys had to go into hiding too. So when they said you got to find somewhere, I called the apartment. Like, heck, man, what, you know, I'm a cop. I ain't got a lake house. I don't have uh, somewhere I can go. This, I said, what do you want me to do? And, and this is May 31st, the 27th. The riot started. The very first night, we had seven people shot in downtown Louisville during these riots. So they're off the hook, right? Now by this point, they're busting people in from out of town. Buildings are being burned. It's chaos now downtown. I felt sorry for them. Guys. How long was it running these riots? Oh, oh. about a year for us. Oh Gosh. shit! Heavy, heavy for about four months. Then it reinvigorated uh, at the end of August or September, whenever it was, when the AG didn't charge us. Two cops got shot that night uh, during the riot. So all these things are going on, and I go, "Where am I supposed to go?" Yeah. And she's my boss was like, "Let me let me go downtown. I'll figure it out." She calls me back and says. Um, they're willing to put you up in the Galt house downtown for a few weeks because they have a, a contract with them. We're going to hand money. deliver this guy. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like what, what did you say? And she told me, I went, forget it. I'll figure it out. So I started making phone calls and a buddy of mine, uh, his, his in-laws had a place a couple hours away. Uh, they weren't using. So at two 30 in the morning, we got this caravan of, cops. are you, st- are you still a cop? No, retired. Retired, okay. Yeah. So we got this caravan of cops going down 65, going to, to this hideaway, you know, place we don't know. Place, we don't know anybody around. Um, and, it, man, it's, it's, we get out. And it's like four in the morning. I'm like, man, is this real life? Is this really yeah. happening? You know, right, everything yeah. just seems so bizarre surreal. and out of whack. Yeah. Surreal, yeah. yeah. John, you, you, you're explaining it as a, as a former officer. What's this going on? Uh, what's the feeling like in your family? Your, oh, your spouse, your kids. Scared to death. You know, I got a, a, a grandkids, you know, they're all getting swooped up in the middle of the night, moved, going, uh, what do we do? Because their houses were already getting, everybody been doxxed at this point. People are going by their houses. Going to, one of them went through the trash at my daughter's house. Um, I mean, taking pictures, just crazy stuff going on. And so my biggest fear wasn't for me. I'm like, screw this. I'll stay behind, strap a Strap an AR, yeah, right. grab a cigar, my underwear, and wait for them. You know, yeah. whatever. Whatever happens, happens. Um, but now I've got them to look out for. It's like a beer right. helmet on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Two straws. Um, and so this goes on for, you know, weeks. And I'm going, nobody's tracking the money now to see if anything's getting moved around. If if these people are coming in from Chicago, yeah. you know. So yeah. so now you're on. they locked the case, right? Yeah. So no one's. Nobody yeah. else. And we begged them, hey, give it to the state police to run. Right. Give it to anybody. Yeah. Give it back to the ATF. Let them run it. They wouldn't even do that. And they wouldn't meet with us. They were, the FBI refused to meet with us. Um, put several contacts out to my attorney, through the department. And they were like, nope, not allowed here. Not allowed here. Not allowed here. And and during this time, they're bringing her family in, talking to them. They're bringing community activists in, briefing them on the case, but won't brief us. Wow. I mean, it. I mean, one of the groups they brought in was underage people, like 16 to 18 year old future activists or whatever you want to call them Future oh, knowledgeable they, and wise people and they briefed them on the case i mean i'm sitting back going this is how unbelievable yeah, how political can you be FBI? yeah and obvious i mean they're just in your face it's yeah, all but not yeah not even hiding it yeah That's who crazy. Was, who was president during the riots well 2020 was trump. trump yeah did he ever give any uh like indication that i'm going to inter- intervene if kentucky can't handle the shit uh, not, <laughs> that's not what he did in portland knowledge. yeah not to my knowledge Wow. Well, we weren't, we weren't. Oh, they were burning federal buildings in Portland. Yeah. That's, that's how he was able to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was nothing there. You got, you guys had a police chief shakeup or anything like that? Something oh yeah. There's been happened? several since then. <laughs> we're on like number four. Tell us about the chief, uh, I think from Atlanta, right? Oh yeah. My goodness. So, so. Because our, Atlanta's doing so well. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's bring them in. Well, Chief Shields. <laughs> chief Shields was the chief in Atlanta during the Wendy's ordeal. <laughs> yeah. The taser. Yep. Oh yeah. She got on there immediately and basically called them guys in up and said what they did was illegal and fired them and did all that stuff. They all got their jobs back because she was an idiot and wrong. Um, <laughs> and so when they fire our police chief, because unfortunately during this incident, they called the National Guard in because things were out of control. They're in an area in our West End where this guy who's beloved by the community, a barbecue guy, um, who's letting dope dealers come in and out of his place sell dope all the time. But he gives police free food, so they love him. You know, one of those deals. They're idiots. (laughs) And and his name's Yaya. And they come out, and the police are clearing this area because curfew's up. 
People are still out shooting guns, all kinds. I mean, it was, it was like the wild west. And we had, there was four different units that refused to go down there. Even SWAT SWAT rolled through and came back and said, no, we're not putting our guys in that situation. They're going to shoot somebody. We're not doing it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a lose, lose. It's a powder keg. We're not doing it. Yeah. Four different people did that. They got to the fourth commander and said, Hey, take your people down there. Yes, I'll do it. Ah, the yes man. Yeah, the Takes man his people down there. Surprised they got the four. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Yeah. They get down there with with the National Guard. They're they're giving commands to clear out. One of the commanders gives a command, uh, put some pepper balls down to get people to clear out. They did. When they did, this guy steps out of his place. It's all on camera because he had cameras all over his place. He steps out, takes a pop shot at the police, steps back in, comes out again, takes another pop shot. Well, National Guard goes boom and drops him with an AR. Nice. The National Guard did? Only the second U.S. citizen ever killed on American soil. Conus by, kill. By Conus kill. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And how that didn't make more news to oh, because they, they, they don't never, understand. I've never heard of it. Yeah. Didn't that, hear that, of it. That's, that's, no, not no. Yeah. And Pro- fortunately for that guy, his name didn't get put out. He didn't get, you know, just demolished. But the female who shot the pepper ball that hit the house where he came out and shot got indicted by the feds. <laughs> <laughs> the ass backwards For shit is what? I, I'm not sure the charge. She ended up civil taking, rights violation. So, <laughs> it was I, I, don't, I don't I can't you remember what the, I can't remember what the original charge was, <laughs> but she ended up taking a lesser plea, which said she would never be a police again and be on probation for two years or whatever it was. Um, yeah, you don't have to say that twice. Man. Job, over yeah, right. right. be a cop again. That's right. That yeah. yeah, so that just kind of gives you the background of what insanity what the police were facing in 2020 well, it was bad with the, with the riots how was your admin as far as in the war zone it boots on ground was admin had one guy the guy that got shot during during the protest he's like as far as i know the only one that was just out there in the middle of it all the time well Aubrey were, gregory i'll give him his credit he's he's a good dude how were they with y'all as far as like because what uh, it was a george floyd one we covered you know, when they were, had no support for, they were out in a war zone with no support. Well, here's what they were getting. Okay. One day it was like, push them back, hold the line, blah, blah, blah. Two hours later, let them have it. Four hours later, push them back, hold the line. So it was, it was a lot of, of, of miscommunication. A lot of, um, one day we're letting them have it. The next day we're taking control and you can't do that. Once you give it up, that's right. You gave it up, man. Yeah. I mean, you, you set the narrative for it. You, you, you allowed them this criminal activity. What are you going to do now? You know, maybe make, make your perimeter a little further out and, and contain them. So the thing that really ticked me off during this is uh, we had something called Jefferson Square. And it was right by our federal court out, or by our uh, courthouse, police station, uh, downtown, right? Right in the middle of downtown. It had our firefighters memorial and police memorial on it. And once a year, they come do the reefs, do all that stuff. So this crew took over that area, mm. defacing the, the, the stuff. So what's the department do? Instead of coming in and pushing them out of the city, they remove the statue or the memorials and let them have that for a year. A year. A year. They camped out there. They put their murals up. Oh, you guys had a jazz. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Had a jazz. Yeah. The the good for you. Uh, pres- uh, uh, one of the <laughs> really big- gentrified the area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really worked out. So and and I think in total down there, just in that area in that year, I think four people were murdered. So it was a real success. Say her name. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. what are their names? Killing each other. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. Well, one, I think it's Tyler Girth. He was a, the only reason I know that is because he got celebrated because he was a white kid who went down there supposedly filming, you know, the, the events. Um, Man. So it was just and bizarre. His life over it. Yeah. Um, well, is that, then was that Yusuf was showing me that clip before you got here. Was that was and his dad was protesting, but was his dad blaming law enforcement for that? Or was he blaming like, was he saying stop rioting? No, I think he blamed law enforcement. I'm oh, pretty yeah, sure. Of course he did. Because Girth, I think was, uh, I think his name is Teller Girth. Um, they, uh, That's my porn name. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's where reality and fiction meet up, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, but yeah, he was, he was for them, filming for them, you know, on their behalf. Gotcha. Yep. You know, he was a sympathizer. And here's the deal, man. You know, we can be mad at all these protesters all we want, but I bet 80% of them really thought they were doing the right thing because they never had the truth. Right. Yeah. So you yeah. almost can't blame them. You can blame the criminal activity in the protest. That's bull crap. But the people who actually just marched and were upset, I get right. it. 
Because yeah. from the outside, if I didn't know me in the situation and I heard all the stuff I heard for eight months, I would go, man, those are some lame cops that did some bad yeah. stuff. You know, yeah. wrong house. Yeah. She was asleep in bed when they killed her. Yeah. Uh, you know, they heard didn't that. find any drugs or no money. knock. Well, warrant. they didn't search it. They weren't allowed to go back in. The narcotics asked, can we go in like 730 in the morning when when the crime scene finally was lifted? They said, let's go execute the search warrant now. <laughs> right. And, and so, the department said, no, we're done with it. Cra so, craziest that, part about that is uh, during the protests and riots, there's about a handful of Louisville officers that got indicted by the feds oh, yeah. for excessive force during the protest, yeah. getting rocks and One of them was a 40 millimeter. So, again, this just shows you the the lack of, of um, what do you want to call it, wisdom in our leadership. So, when we go through the academy, you know, you're you qualified with your gun. You do your self-defense. You do all the stuff. And then you've got your less lethal. you got your pepper ball, boom, boom, boom. You shoot some rounds. You get your 40 millimeter, you shoot two rounds, two rounds, always shot, pop, pop. Oh, congratulations. You're now qualified <laughs> with this 40 millimeter. 10 years later, they hand this guy a 40 millimeter. Hadn't shot one, hadn't handed Hell one yeah. in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> They're handing out all this equipment like toys to all these cops, right? They hadn't shot these things in years. You don't know the trajectory of it. You don't know how accurate all this right, stuff. Yeah. They're on the line and, and this one guy's there and I know him, he used to work for me. He's standing there and they're throwing rocks. They're doing all that stuff in bottles. And the commander, whoever it was back here said, if one more bottle comes flying our way, light them up with the 40. Okay, cool. Who doesn't want to do that? Right. Right. I mean, it's just human nature. Bottle comes flying. He says, go. He comes up, pop. Well, he's a little bit too close to this guy and it hits him right in the face and knocks hit in the face and knocks him out. <laughs> <laughs> so that guy wins a lawsuit. Oh, trajectory. Uh <laughs> that guy wins a lawsuit. This officer gets arrested. Another lawsuit. How much? Who knows? I don't know. Arrested oh, in the chaos, in yeah. the chaos of a riot. The most stressful time of your career with a piece of equipment you used 10 years ago, one time or two shots, but one time. Uh, and, uh, and, and you're asked to do it. Is he still in jail? Do it. No, he took a plea also to did, not be a cop uh, on paper Corey for Evans? a couple of years. I knew of him. Yeah. That guy had apparently some PTSD stuff from the war. Um, he was a little bit heavy handed from what I heard at other times. Um, Using his hippie stick a little bit. Yeah, he did. That's what got him. That's what got him. He, uh, give, a guy was giving up and running his mouth, and he just gave him a good whack to the head. I probably deserved it and needed it, but I, not legal. I'll tell you what jumps out to me is you, you do have a lot of uh, empathy for the other side in the situation, yeah. and, and, you, and you've shown it several times. And I think that's to be, uh, you know, um, you know, if, brought up. If you can't do that, then you can't you can't judge the other people for what they do. If you can't honestly sit back and look at it from both sides and go, okay, where, what caused this? All right. And if I only take my side and the police side, because police are wrong sometimes, let's get it, let's be honest. And in this case, the police at the top are wrong, causing all the boots on the ground, a lot of problems. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can't sit back and do that and go, I understand why they did that. I don't agree with it, but I understand why. Right. Then, then I'm no, no better than that. Yeah. And, and, and I agree with you. And I know you're not saying this, but the, so I, I, I agree with that, that Sorry. aspect. Yes. I mean, that's, that's your constitutional right. You can, you can come out and peacefully Peaceful. protest, but once you start lobbing, probably frozen water bottles, yeah. uh, rocks and coming out of your house and taking pop shots at, at cops, you've, you've completely lost you control. That. Yeah, that's right. You forfeited it and you no longer, you know, have you, the, the just cause that you think you're out there for is now completely lost. I have, yeah. Now I have no empathy for you. Right, right. And that's sick. That's what I'm saying. 80%. Yeah. Okay. That 20%, yeah. too bad. Yeah. Cut your head off and go. No, and it, you, <laughs> Figuratively. And interview, Figuratively. In, interview, we're not in the Middle East. Interview one of those people throwing rocks and see what the, no see how much knowledge they even have on the information that's out there. My bad, Yusef. <laughs> <laughs> I've been through worse. <laughs> but I mean, Rise in those big cities like Florida. Florida has no metropolitan cities that have been around, been around for generations, generations, generations. That's why everything happens here. There's no huge Orlando takeover. There's no Jacksonville. There's no Miami because the these mouse big, won't have it. Huh? The mouse won't have it. Well, that oh, and oh, that's why. Yeah. And these, but these and big cities. Norwell DeSantis. These yeah. people have been living in democratic suppression for generations. That's all they know. Yeah. That's all they know is. Poverty and government housing. And then when something like this happens, that's a lot of frustration coming out. It's generations yeah. worth of being pissed off, rightfully so, because you don't know it. It's the Democratic leaders that are keeping you here. And, of course, the cops. Just like you telling this whole story, nobody above the boots 
everybody washed their hands of it. Yeah. And it's the expendable street cops. Well, my, my major didn't. She tried to intervene and she got demoted and the FBI threatened to lock her up for interfering with investigation. No way. So that tells you what happens if you try to do the right thing in this industry. Um, you'll get, you will get your career head cut off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you came out here, uh, this was one of the, the, the few times I actually kind of got to hear the story before the full story here because you came out and hung out in the studio when you were here in Orlando at the FOP conference. Yeah. Uh, and it, it just, I I thought I knew the story because it's, it's a big story, you know, and, and I would look into it, you know, at the time of and try to, you know, get to the bottom of it, which was hard to do because no one was telling the facts, mm-hmm. you know, um, no one was getting your side of the story out there. So it was hard to do. But really, it was uh, as much as really you blew my mind with the uh, Brianna Taylor shooting itself. It was the aftermath that 100%. is a, such a bigger story than anyone knows that her mom was in a motorcycle gang that put out a hit for for, paid for, for it and paid for paid it. for with, it with lawsuit money the government gave her. Oh yeah, that's a GoFundMe account too, right oh, there. Just God, it, yeah. it just you know how political the FBI was. It just it just goes on and on what what they did to people, what they did to your you know to to your major. It just the the Brianna shooting story itself is, is half the story. I don't think uh, I think people now if you're if you're listening to me now you've heard it and uh, you understand what what I'm saying. It's just you're yeah, mind boggling. You're not to me, and this is true because I'm right. <laughs> if you you are not a cop if the word optics come out of your mouth yeah you are not a cop all right well back to chief shields then okay um because sh- these these people in political power are all about optics so when i talked about that shooting that's when our chief at the time lost his job when that shooting took place with with the national guard and, and, okay. and that officer he lost his job we had an interim chief come in uh for a while and then another interim chief and then they put a national search higher out, right? Like they always do. And they let the community put their input in and, and all this. And the, the brilliant minds that be looked down at Atlanta at that, at, cause she screwed up on that after this fact, after the Brianna Taylor thing is when the Wendy's thing happened during ah, all this okay. stuff. So we had Brianna, George Floyd, all that. Then you had the Wendy's incident. I think that was in 21. And then or the end of 20 or beginning of 21. I can't remember. You just have to find out. And then in their brilliance and in their wisdom, they said, she's the perfect candidate for this job. Let's bring her in. Erica Shields. She's a, a gay, white, female married to a black woman, right? So she fits the dynamic. Let's put her in here. She'll be awesome for this job. Her very first press conference, she gets on TV. I'm still on the job. All right. She sends this email out before she does a press conference. I've got an open door policy. I'll support you. All this stuff. Her very first press conference, she gets on TV and says, "Um, this is race reckoning. Brianna was asleep in her bed. This didn't have to happen. They would never do this in a white end of town or to white people. And I'm sitting there going, are are you kidding me? Right. Uh, Have you done any research on this case at all? Time to execute that open door policy. Yeah. (laughs) So, so, boom, 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 email. We need to meet. Crickets. Again, maybe you didn't get my first email. We need to meet. I got an email back from her adjutant saying, you need to handle this through your chain of command. Oof. Wow. Well, you already cut my chain of here's, command's head off. So, you know, here's for trying to ask the same questions. Here's something I've, I've never really, uh, uh, agreed with. And, and you guys would, would, would know better. And tell me, tell me if, if, uh, if I'm right on this, never really agreed on bringing in an, an outsider to, to, to be the chief. Um, they have no investment in it. They have, well, they have no investment in it. Uh, well, they do now. They have financial and 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 political investment in it. But you're asking someone who didn't spend the last twenty to thirty years in this environment and doesn't know the ins and outs of this community. community's culture and this and Absolutely. so. And now you're asking them to come in and fix it, something they know nothing about. I think it briefs well, but I don't see how it pans out well. It usually doesn't. I mean, that's what they do. I equate the the Chiefs to. NFL and NBA coaches where they they're constantly on the same circuit. They'll go into a, a department just like a, a, a new coach will go into a NFL organization, screw it up. They'll get bought out of their contract for doing horrible. They'll get paid a million bucks. And then the next team hires them and they just keep ha- passing the trash. Yeah. And that's kind of what chiefs are doing right now across the country. This chief screws something up. They get rewarded with their buyout. 
They get a huge contract here. They screw up. They get rewarded with their contract. Now she, I think she works for the FBI or for the feds. <laughs> DOJ. She works for DOJ. What am I doing? Yeah, I did something wrong. I should have yeah, just been a snake I need and to stab be a, people in the back. And, oh. I'm going to start saying the word optics <laughs> everywhere I go. Yeah. Well, the uh, it's it doesn't seem like a a whole lot of uh, well, you've actually had, you've had a, a few funny stories from from when you got shot. You know, yeah. there's there's always there's always a little bit of you know uh, comedy in the chaos. Like there, there really is. You want to hear going? If you got, All right. we always end end, end our uh, our podcast with a funny story, especially this one because everyone's probably a, a little bit upset after listening uh, to your story, rightfully so. Ended on a funny note. If so, you got one, so we're in the EMS, and I'll back up a little bit just to kind of give you what what happened in the EMS wagon, and I'll give you a little bit of mad, and then end it with funny. So <laughs> we get in, and the white kid never put a hand on me. The black kid never put a hand on me. They're totally lost. We get in the wagon and I'm sitting in the back on the gurney. Well, first of all, we get to the end of the, in there. And as I'm finally at the ambulance, my Lieutenant picks me up, carries me over this fence. He's six, six played baseball in college. So he's, he's an athlete. And, but I can still hear him. Oh, oh, Cause you know, at the time, <laughs> yeah. like two ten, I had some gear on. So yeah, it's heavy, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. plus he's got all his stuff on. Right. So we get there and, and the white kid's just kind of following us with his bag on his shoulder. He seemed like a good kid. No, you know, I got no beef with him. He's young. And we get to the back and the black kid opens up and he pulls the gurney out while I'm standing there. And I grab it and I went, we don't need this. And I pushed it back in and I hobble in and I get on the back of right. it and I'm sitting here and Tony James, one of the guys who went to the academy with me that was on scene that night, he jumps in. So now I got the white kid to my left, Tony here, the black guy here, and we're just sitting there and we're staring at each other and nothing's happening. And they're going, and Tony goes, man, what do you need me to do? Do you want me to drive or something? And the white kid went, no, I'll drive. He didn't want nothing to do with it. Pew, he went up front. He disappeared. I couldn't see him. So now it's Tony and the black guy. And we're standing there, and we're doing this again. As I can hear the beep, beep. And he's trying to get through this, navigate this tight area yeah. uh, where they had pulled up too deep. And and Tony goes, man, what do you what do you need me to do? And the black guy looks around and goes, uh, I can't find my big gauze. And I'm like. Big God, dude, I'm already wrapped up. Just give me meds or something. Which right. later find out they had no authority to give meds. They were the basic life BLS oh, guys. No. Oh, he sent them to the search warrant. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> nobody could yeah. do anything. Yeah. We're prepared. And they can put a band aid on me. Thanks. <laughs> um, so you've been shot. <laughs> That's all I can do. <laughs> so they're standing there, and I look at this black dude, and I went, dude, am I your first gunshot victim? Yeah. He gets right at my face right here. And he goes, to be honest, you are. And I said, well, I've never been shot, so let's not fuck this up. And so about that time, the ambulance stops and the doors open up and it's like uh, heaven. Like the lights come in. It's two paramedics from the fire department. I knew one of them. Right. He stopped and he went, I didn't expect it to be you. And I went, I'm glad it's you. Let's go. They get in, man. They start cutting. They put IV in both arms, fentanyl and Dilaudid and all this yeah. stuff. Here so it was good going. stuff. Well, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> well like tripping. four months later, the black EMS guy puts this post on Facebook saying, I responded to this scene. Nobody told me there was another victim in the house. Um, I saved this man's life. Had I known what I was saving a monster, no. I would do it different. I'm like, dude, you didn't know your head from your ass during this. You were scared to death. You knew you did nothing. Um, so all that aside. He no kept longer, his job still. No, he's he? no longer EMS. All he right. wasn't EMS at the time. He couldn't handle it. He went to like uh, some emergency room doing tech stuff, but. Wow. They may have gotten a he few was calls from police families and, Taylor. and he lost that job. <laughs> so the funny part. So we get down to to the the hospital. And we're at University of Louisville Hospital. And if you get shot or if you're in a bad car wreck, their room nine, which is their trauma room, is where you want to be in Kentucky. They're right. like spot on, man. These guys are professional. They're good at their job. If you get there, you're probably going to stay alive. And I knew I was staying alive anyway. Turnic was on. I'm talking. Um, and we get there. And as we're coming out, I remember thinking, man, this is going to hurt this gurney hitting the ground, right? Because I see it because I'm in pain. So I'm staying up on my right hip as much as I can. They're like, sit down. I'm like, I can't, dude. The pressure's killing me. Even with the meds? Oh, yeah. Meds weren't touching it. I got another round inside. Then it started working. So we get there and and he comes out and it bounces. And I'm like, oh, crap. And Tony rubs my head and he goes, it's okay, little buddy. I didn't have a head on. He goes, it's okay, little buddy. And I grabbed his hand and went, don't touch my hair. It's the only good thing left on me. Because I'm vain, right? <laughs> So we're rolling in and I'm looking up and seeing lights like these and it dawns on me. I'm getting ready to go into room nine. I've been in this hospital many times when the siren or whatever, the alarm goes off in room yeah. nine and it's a training hospital, right? For the university of Louisville okay. for their med school. And I know every time room nine happens, it fills up with people being 
They're students. They want to see. Oh, right? I, know where, yeah. I know where this is going. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking, oh, crap. They're going to recut my pants. That's right. <laughs> I'm surprised. So it's I'm cold on. in here. Well, they were cut up, but <laughs> okay. cover my package. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler so, Girth. Yes. <laughs> I was girthing it. So we get in there, and, and sure enough, they wheel me back in this corner. And I'm sitting there looking around, and there's like 30, 35 people in a semicircle there that weren't working on me. And 90% of them are females, 20 to 24 years old. And I'm thinking, oh, here it goes. So I look at the doctor. She's getting ready to cut. And I went, wait a minute. I said, can I fluff this up real quick? <laughs> and they laughed, which I was thankful for because I was like, didn't want to disappoint. Right. You know, yeah, right. I mean, because, right, blood makes this organ work, yeah. right? <laughs> That's my excuse. You let me have my own excuse as to why I needed this, need a little help. Uh, so yeah, that was the weird stuff your mind goes through when, you know, you're even trying yeah. to save your life. You just don't care. Yeah. You're like, oh, um, I don't want to be naked in front of these people. I'm, I'm, Unless I, I was Tyler Girth. <laughs> 